Okay, so this uh, module is quite large. There's a lot of material to cover. I will do a uh, study guide when it's coming close to the time to do the test, um, but don't freak out too much. I know there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, we'll go over some of this a lot so that you can hear how things are pronounced and um, just the basic structures of the different types of digestive systems when we're talking about small animals versus ruminants. Um, so to start off with, we have um, herbivores, which eat only plant material, and they include ruminants, and ruminants include cattle and goats, and non-ruminants are horses. Carnivores eat meat, just like cats. Cats are obligate carnivores, meaning that they cannot survive without eating meat. Um, so if somebody wants to try to put their cat on an all vegan or vegetarian diet, um, that won't work. And I've had someone suggest that before. Um, I think now with there being so many vegans and vegetarians out there, um, I'm hoping that this won't become a thing of the future. Uh, omnivores eat a combination of plants and meat. So humans, pigs, and dogs. So the process of digestion has two processes to it. Uh, breakdown, mechanical digestion, which starts in the mouth by chewing or maceration, mixes with saliva to form a bolus that is swallowed, otherwise known as deglut deglutition, and is transported to the simple stomach of animals or the reticulorumen in ruminants. The mechanical breakdown occurs in the stomach as well with mixing and kneading and further breakdown into smaller particles and then goes on to peristalsis. Um, chemical reactions also start in the mouth with saliva and enzymes. So amylase is one of them that breaks down starch, but cats, dogs, and ruminants lack amylase in their saliva. The most um, common form of chemical reaction occurs in the stomach with enzymes and acids that further break down food. So further to that, the gastrointestinal tract is where digestion takes place. Um, the anatomical differences depend on what the animal eats. So um, when we're talking about cats and dogs, they only have the one stomach. Um, then horses have one stomach as well, but they are known as hind gut fermenters. So they um, ferment their grass or cellulose type products in their hind gut with a mixture of bacteria. And um, humans, cats and dogs, may have done that in the past um, and now that's part of possibly the vestigial or smaller part um, of the cecum so that may have been larger in the past when they and us needed to digest more plant type material um, but now that's one of the biggest anatomical differences um, and then the ruminants have four stomachs so that's even more of a totally different process um, so they Kind of ferment their food in their four stomachs. Um, so yeah, a big difference is there and uh, we'll get into them down the line here. The basic structure of the gastrointestinal tract is pretty much the same. It's a tube that runs from the oral cavity to the anus. Structures include the oral cavity, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. Within that structure is four layers of tissue. So there's the mucosa, which is the innermost um, facing structure to the lumen. So lumen is the basically hollow um, inside of the tube. And then um, within that tube, the first layer is the mucosa. And then behind the mucosa is the submucosa. And that is in the wording with sub, which means under. And then the muscular layer, so there's two. There is the circular muscle, muscle layer and then the longitudinal muscle layer. And then on the outside is the serosa. So the serosa is what you see when you're looking into an animal's abdominal cavity during surgery. So that is the outside layers of the intestine. And that, that is the same for um, all of those layers. Mucosa is always the inside and then the outside is also always the serosa. So the regulation of the gastrointestinal system has 
Um, two major ones are the combination of the central nervous system and endocrine system, and then the enteric nervous system with intrinsic endocrine paracrine component. Um, so the big one is the enteric um, nervous system, where they are calling that the brain of the gut, and that contains receptors, sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. So that controls motor and secretory functions. Um, if you remember that in your nervous system chapters, there's the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And during um, parasympathetic stimulation is when most of the digestion is occurring. Um, so that's when digestion is enhanced, whereas um, sympathetic is the fight or flight. And that is when um, digestion is inhibited so that more of the attention can be focused on uh, bringing blood to your vital organs and basically anything that will help you fight or flight out of a stressful situation. So um, I had said in my nervous system part, it's easier to remember that I think by thinking of the sympathetic nervous system being very sympathetic to your current situation of really needing to fight or flight. And um, if you need to fight or flight, you obviously don't need to be digesting, doing digestion. So um, hopefully that helps you remember the two differences. Um, parasympathetic, don't need to fight or flight, so why not take some time to do some digestion? Whereas sympathetic, you need to get out of there. So um, sending blood and um, attention to the gastrointestinal tract doesn't make sense. The oral cavity is also known as the buccal cavity or buccal cavity. Um, it contains everything in the mouth and there are two parts to it. There is the vestibule, which is the space between the lips, cheeks, and outer surfaces of the teeth, and the oral cavity, which is bordered by inner surfaces of the teeth, hard and soft palates. So um, that's the part that you're looking in basically when you're doing your intubation um, so that whole cavity there and the vestibule is really where um, you can feel the outer surfaces of your cheek and the outer surfaces of your teeth with your tongue. The makeup of teeth is the same in humans, but the way that their um, shape is a lot different, especially with this tooth we're looking at here, which is a canine. Um, they have really deep roots that go down and curve into the jaw. So those ones are really hard to extract, but the um, makeup of it is the same. So there is a crown, which is the pointy part that you can see from the outside and the root um, with an apex, which is the part that is deepest into the bone layer there. Um, so the root also has uh, the apex and the neck. Um, the enamel is the harder outside surface and as you learned in your bone session, um, enamel is the hardest substance in um, your body. Then there's the dentin in the inside and the pulp cavity. Um, on the outside, there's the gingiva and then the mucosal layer. The surfaces of the tooth have their own names and um, they're named by the direction that they face. So there's the buccal, surface, which is the outer surface of the teeth that is facing your cheeks um, or what you can see when you smile. The labial surface, so labial or labia means lips, so that should be easy to remember. And that is the surface that is facing the lips. Um, the lingual, which is the inner surface facing the tongue and the palate, which is the surface facing the soft palate. Um, so buccal means cheek. Um, labial means lip, lingual means tongue, palatal means palate basically, which doesn't have any easy way to remember, but there's the hard and soft palate. So the hard palate is the hard surface at the roof of your mouth, and the soft palate is just behind that, or what you're sometimes trying to kind of fight with when you're intubating a patient, especially in brachycephalic breeds. That's the part that they often need resected because it hangs in front of their trachea and causes that really loud, disturbing airflow. So these are just more of the structure of the tooth, just going from outside to inside. Um, it would be good to know, um, or you must know, that the outer surface um, is the enamel, 
And um, so we're talking about the part of the tooth that you can see. Um, so that'd be at the crown of the tooth. And then just under that is the um, the pulp cavity, or sorry, the dentin. So enamel and then dentin, and then um, pulp cavity, which does extend to the outer part of the tooth. Um, there's the infidibulum, um, and then there's the gum line, I guess, on that top picture. Um, below the uh, below the tooth line or gum line, um, it then goes, instead of having enamel, they have cementum, which is that thin bone layer, then dentin, and then the pulp cavity again. So the infidibulum um, is just on the equine tooth there, and it actually is a really deep groove. Um, we do not have that in carnivore um, or human teeth. So classification of teeth, there are the brachiodonts and the hypsodonts. So brachiodonts are carnivores, humans, and pigs, also ruminant incisors. So they're small crowns with well-developed roots, and they do not grow continually. So that's a big difference. Um, the hypsodont tooth, um, just think of horses incisors and cheek teeth. Um, they need to be constantly ground down, same with rodents like mice and lagomorphs, which are rabbits. So if they're not ground down, um, and often the ones that we keep as pets need to actually have us have them ground down, um, or they become really long and can grow into the roof of their mouth or um, their cheeks and become very painful. Um, this is one big reason that a horse or a rat or a rabbit may stop eating, um, or it kind of makes it so they can't chew properly, which can cause digestion issues as well. So hypsodont teeth, um, large reserve of the crown beneath the gingiva, and they grow continually. Here again are just some more differences between the brachiodont and hypsodont tooth. Um, so this is a good picture of the brachiodont tooth. It has the enamel, the dentin, the pulp cavity, um, gingival sulcus, and then that uh, periodontal ligament, which is the ligament that um, if any of you have seen um, tooth extractions, uh, when I was just graduated or even before, um, I was taught how to remove teeth because it wasn't something that we weren't allowed to do until a couple of years later. So that periodontal ligament is what you use your elevators for um, and sit there and have to tirelessly try to make that ligament tire and come away from the tooth. Um, in a healthier tooth, that can take forever. And then there's the bone, um, the apical delta, where the pulp cavity meets those um, nerves and uh, the cementin again, which is that bone, thin bone that is attached to the periodontal ligament and the tooth. And then on the other side is the hypsodont tooth. Um, so they still have cementum, um, dentin, and enamel, um, but their pulp cavities are much smaller and they have an open root apex. So a um, bit of a difference there. In the hypsodont teeth, there is radicular hypsodont which the apices or the apical part of the root remain open for a long time. So that was um, that picture uh, that we just saw previously where there's that open spot um, space there. So the apices in these particular teeth eventually do close and stop growing. And these are the teeth found in the cheek of a horse. The aradicular hypsodont teeth lack a true root and they grow continuously throughout the animal's life. Um, so those are the teeth found in lagomorphs, um, so rabbits, and some rodents. Uh, so think of those front teeth of rabbits and rats that continually grow and um, need to be ground down by their own chewing. And um, uh, usually some people give them uh, little toys that they can chew on and, uh, and or we have to grind them down for them. So nothing really new here. Everyone has deciduous teeth, including humans. It's your baby teeth. All domestic species have two sets of teeth. So deciduous ones and permanent or adult, adult teeth. The deciduous teeth are smaller and whiter and often hollow. Um, they are present in the jaw at birth and they erupt through the gums at different times depending on species. 
So in most cases, um, cats and dogs should have a full set of their adult teeth by about six months. Um, the smaller breeds like Chihuahuas and Yorkies, uh, we would often remove their deciduous teeth if they were still present at their spay and neuter. Um, and a lot of the times you could see their deciduous teeth right next to their adult teeth. And that can really cause a lot of damage for those adult teeth. Um, so that's usually a good time to take them out. So they're already under anesthesia um, and they really should be gone by then. Heterodentition is really just referring to the different types of teeth. So hetero means different, homo means the same. So um, basically hetero is just the different types and shape of teeth, including the incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. So those are all different, they have different functions, um, therefore they are heterodont. Unfortunately, this is something that you need to remember um, is the dental formula and the total number of teeth. So um, make sure you know these. Um, canine puppy has 28, adult has 42. They want you to know which teeth um, a puppy possesses that an adult doesn't. Same with kitten and adult. Um, and equine, porcine, and bovine, um, you just have to know the number of teeth they have. The triadin system is one that we use in veterinary medicine. Um, there is a video done by Rabina Mansfield in your module that um, she has a skull and she goes through um, the buccal surfaces and all the inside of the mouth and the teeth, the different um, numbering structures. So that's a really good video to watch. But this is how we number um, and chart our dog and cat teeth when we're doing that and horse. Um, so that's one, another thing you need to know. Um, I found it really helpful to draw a circle and um, then draw um, a line down the middle and a line across so that you have four quadrants there and label that um, right starting from the top left. So that would be number one and then going left to the top right of your circle, which is number two and then bottom right is number three and bottom left is number four. So that is right, left looking at the top and then um, left, right looking at the bottom. I hope I said that right. It's hard to say without looking at it, but um, I will maybe include something um, that shows you guys that because I still to this day write that circle and draw it out with my right, left, left, right, and then the one, two, three, four going clockwise around that circle. Um, and I don't do dentals anymore being in emergency medicine, but if an animal comes in with a missing tooth, I still need to know how to number that appropriately for the medical records. So the tongue has three parts, the apex, body and root. Um, the apex is almost always going to be the pointy part of anything. So the apex of the heart is the pointy part. Um, the apex of the tooth is one of the pointy parts. Um, and then the body and the root is always where it is um, basically, I guess, attached to. Uh, so I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, then there's papillae on the dorsal surface and um, that's for grooming. So Cats have really obvious papillae and um, also helps move food into the pharynx. Um, and then the specialized functions such as taste, uh, pain, temperature, touch, thermoregulation through panting for dogs and thermoregulation um, with the saliva from grooming for cats. So onto saliva, the functions are lubrication, antibacterial action with that lysosome, um, pH regulation, thermal regulation. Um, so with the panting, um, that's more of an evaporation process in the mouth on the tongue. Um, the thermal regulation that is more described is the um, grooming and depositing that saliva onto the animal's coat and skin. 
and then the evaporation of that saliva, which is actually the cooling mechanism. Um, and then there's the enzymatic digestion uh, with amylase. Um, and then there's uh, the three paired glands, so the parotid, the mandibular, and the sublingual. Um, those are the three main um, salivary glands that you guys were pointing out in your assignment one. The temporal mandibular joint, otherwise known as the TMJ, is the connection between the condylar process of the mandible, so the bottom, and the mandibular process, mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. So that is the upper part, and the fossa is where the mandible connects with the upper temporal bone. Um, it's responsible for movements such as extension, flexion, and translation, which um, maybe is better thought of as when a horse is moving its mouth side to side, um, but it's a dietary preference that is influencing the extent of that transition. And I believe they're talking about um, like a horse chewing hay and how they go side to side. The pharynx or the throat is part of both the GI and respiratory tracts. So it's um, responsible for the swallowing and sending food from the oral cavity to the esophagus. And um, it also is where the um, epiglottis would stop that food from entering the um, trachea. Um, the structures found in there are also the eustachian tube. So you remember that from your sense um, where it drains from the ear and the tonsils. Digestion in the oral cavity um, and pharynx starts with prehension. So that is uh, how they actually get that food into their mouth um, with the horse and um, cow using their lips for the horse and the tongue for the cow. So they have a really long tongue. Horses have very flexible lips. Um, and then the chewing or otherwise known as mastication, the salivary secretion, which is regulated by the nervous system and um, is also triggered by condition responses such as that um, Pavlov's dog where um, he was ringing a bell when he would feed his dog and um, the dog got conditioned to hearing that bell, knowing he was gonna be fed and having that saliva enter his mouth. Um, same with us if we think of something really good. So that is salivary secretion. Swallowing or glute deglutition is voluntary um, there's a uh, pharyngeal stage and esophageal stage, which initiates peristalsis. And there's also an involuntary part of this as well. So obviously when we're swallowing, we're doing that voluntarily. And then the um, involuntary action is the uh, peristalsis. Peristalsis is the pattern of muscle contraction that propels food through the GI tract. So it starts in the esophagus, goes all through the small intestines, and it's that contraction that sends that bolus of food through the system. Um, you can see that when you're doing any abdominal surgery, you can see their intestines start to move, um, which is great. In a lot of the abdominal surgeries that we do, like for foreign body, they have um, the peristalsis is shut down or GI stasis, and um, basically that stop. But I've Scene where they've had a surgery and um, by the end of it that peristalsis has started again you can see things moving through. So this is a really good diagram of all the different layers um, of the abdominal cavity in specific um, one of the sections here of intestine. So um, there's a serous membrane found in the abdominal cavity, which should be reviewed from last year or last semester, uh, with the visceral peritoneum. Um, so remember, anything that's visceral is usually lying against an organ or um, to the inside of that. The parietal layer is the outside. Um, and then the mesentery and the omentum. Um, but in this structure picture here, you can see the serosa that we're talking about earlier on the outside, um, and then the different layers there are going through the submucosa, um, the different muscle layers there. So you can see the circular rings and then the longitudinal layer. Uh, so circular going 
um, kind of clockwise or around and longitudinal going the total opposite way and going back like from back, back to front, I guess. Um, the submucosa and the glands and ducts that are in there, and then the mucosal layer, which is that final layer that faces the inside of that lumen. Um, so there's the mucose um, epithelium, the lamina propria, sorry, lamina propria, and then the muscularis mucosae. Um, there's lymph nodes in there. Uh, I just think this is a really good picture that shows you all the different layers and um, all the different structures that are found within those layers. So the omentum is a big stretch of um, a covering basically that covers from the stomach all the way down to the intestines. And um, it is really important in helping kind of cover that um, inner contents and it can be really important also for trying to heal if there's been erosion or surgery. So it is a double layer that connects the peritoneum um, that links the stomach to the abdominal wall or other organs. So there's the lesser omentum and the greater omentum. Um, in this picture here, you can see how it is connecting to that stomach layer and then kind of drapes over everything else. So um, it goes all the way down to the level of the rectum in this picture. Um, there's a, probably a better picture in your lab manual where you can see what this actually looks like. You've probably seen it if you've seen any of abdominal surgery as that big kind of lacy looking fatty structure. So moving on to the stomach, the functions are storage of ingested food, the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food, production of intrinsic factor for vitamin B12 absorption in the small intestine. Um, the food leaves the stomach in a semi-liquid form called chyme. So the animal groups based on stomach anatomy can be quite different. There's the monogastric or single um, stomach, dog, cats, and horses. The ruminants have a complex consisting um, stomach of four chambers. So those are cows, goats, and sheep. And unfortunately, they really didn't think ahead, I don't think, naming these stomachs because there are four stomachs and there's also a four stomach with the F-O-R-E meaning the like four or a head. Um, so it's an unfortunate way to name things, but um, there's a lot of unfortunate naming in um, medical and especially in uh, anatomy, I believe. The monogastric stomach is a backwards C-shaped organ located just behind the diaphra diaphragm. Um, so on an x-ray, if you're looking at an x-ray, that is on the, um, the left of the animal. Um, it's kind of one way you can tell if your x-rays are DV or VD, uh, although you can't bank on that because some animals have um, an anatomy that is backwards. Not very many, but I have seen it. Um, so located on the left side, um, there is the fundus, um, the esophagus area there, which has the cardia portion. So there's the cardiac sphincter that's there. Um, so you can just remember that because that is the sphincter that is closest to the heart. Um, that's why it's called cardia. Then there's the body there, um, the pyloric antrum, and then the pylorus, which is that other sphincter, um, the pyloric sphincter. And that leads into the duodenum. So inside that stomach, there are the rugae um, or rugal folds, and you can see these on x-rays of really empty stomachs that have gas, uh, so you can actually see these folds. So they are um, transient folds, meaning that they can move um, within the gastric mucosa, and they allow the stomach to expand when filled with food, and then they collapse back down. So this picture here is showing um, a collapsed stomach with all those rugal folds um, kind of folded up together. Um, they also increase the surface area for absorption. So within that mucosal layer, there are gastric pits. Um, so they are, there's different glandular cells, each with different secretions. Um, there's a mucus neck cell, cheek cell, and a parietal cell. 
and then the uh, endocrine cell there in the middle. Um, so they all have different um, secretory or secretions that they um, excrete into the stomach, which all have different um, uh, functions, which uh, will come up next. So the secretions of the mucus, neck cells, chief cell, and parietal cells are, um, so mucus, neck cells, we'll start with, um, they secrete a thin, less viscous mucus than the surface of the mucus cells, and they are also considered progenitor cells, um, or they are capable of dividing and creating new cells. So progenitor, um, like progeny, means creating something new. Um, so they either uh, migrate up into the mucosal surface or farther down into the gastric glands where they remain mucus cells or they become parietal or chief cells. So the um, chief cells are the um, located in the fundic glandular region and they are uh, the cells that secrete pepsinogen. So pepsinogen is an uh, inactive precursor form to the enzyme pepsin. Um, so that is also one of the enzymes that is uh, in the acidic environment of the stomach um, created by hydrochloric acid. So the pepsin um, made from pepsinogen and HCl are the um, really the main um, enzymes that help digest or eat because they're very acidic. Um, and then the other one is the parietal cells. Um, so they are gastric glands um, that secrete the hydrogen and uh, chloride, which form the hydrochloric acid or HCl in the lumen of the stomach. Um, the parietal cells also secrete intrinsic factor, which is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12 in the small intestine. Um, so in the cat, the pancreas, and not the parietal cells of the stomach secrete this intrinsic factor. Um, just as a side note, I guess, um, a lot of animals that have um, intestinal issues or pancreatic issues in a cat have to get this vitamin B12 um, extrinsically or from the outside. So you will see a lot of cats getting vitamin B12 um, as a supplement if they have um, pancreatic issues, especially, or really any kind of uh, gastrointestinal insufficiency. Pepsin is a proteolytic enzyme meaning protein lytic or lytic meaning to break down. So it's protein lytic or protein um, breaking down enzyme. Um, it begins the chemical digestion of proteins. It is activated in the fundus. Um, and this activation is when the pepsinogen secreted by the chief cells is converted to pepsin in the presence of that hydrochloric acid that exists in the stomach. Pyloric gland region of the stomach. Um, there are different regions. There is the pyloric antrum, the pyloric canal, and then the pylorus. And the pylorus is what is uh, attaching the stomach to the small intestines by way of the duodenum. You might hear some people calling this the duodenum. Um, either or, they're both, this, both correct. Uh, so it opens into the duodenum through the pyloric sphincter. Um, like I said before, the esophagus is met by the cardiac sphincter, and then at the other end of the stomach is that pyloric sphincter. Um, cells found here are the mucus secreting cells and the G cells that secrete gastrin. So here are some fun words that I'll probably trip over, but uh, the stimulation of stomach secretions, there's three substances that are stimulated by secretion by glandular cells. So acetylcholine from cholinergic neurons, um, that goes back to your nervous system. Gastrin is a hormone that is released by the G cells. So G for gastrin. Histamine is secreted by the enterochromaffin-like cells or ECL cells in the gastric mucosa. There is a cephalic phase of secretion, which is um, meaning your head. So cephalic means head or ceph. Um, it's the same as a cephalic vein. It is, goes up to um, the part of the vena cava that meets with the head. Um, so that is the part where it is the anticipation of eating a meal 
through your brain. So cephalic head brain. Um, and then the gastric phase, which is um, when the food actually enters the stomach. So the cephalic phase of secretion is going into a bit more, um, a bit more into it. Uh, so it begins with the anticipation of eating and it involves all of the neuron processes um, of that enteric system. So the enteric nervous system is stimulated when you start thinking about eating and then uh, that releases acetylcholine, which binds to receptors. Um, the parietal cells secrete hydrogen ions and chloride ions that then form hydrochloric acid. The chief cells start secreting pepsinogen into the stomach where it meets that hydrochloric acid and becomes pepsin. Um, so those are responsible for helping break down the food as well as the G cells secrete gastrin, that hormone, into the bloodstream, which then travels to the parietal cells and the ECL cells. And they tell those cells to secrete their secretions such as histamine. So then the acetylcholine also triggers the histamine release um, and stimulates the parietal cells to produce even more hydrochloric acid. So all of this is a uh, feedback kind of loop where you start thinking about eating and your um, central nervous system just starts all of this for you so that as soon as you eat all of these systems and pathways and hormones and enzymes are already on their way to receiving that food to help start break it down. So now we're moving on to the ruminant stomach. Um, there are four chambers and the first three of these chambers are called the four stomachs, which is really a terrible name when there's four actual stomachs in a ruminant, but they call the first three of them four stomachs. I don't know, but they are the reticulum, the rumen and the omasum. And the last stomach is the abomasum um, or the true stomach. So that's more like a human canine or feline stomach. The rumen is the one that occupies most of the left side of the abdominal cavity, and it's where there is um, microorganisms contained for the fermentation of carbohydrates. And um, there are papillae in mucosa that increase surface area for absorption, much like our stomach. Um, and then there are pillars that divide the rumen into a dorsal, ventral, and then two caudal sacs. The esophageal groove is something that is important for young ruminants to have. It basically bypasses the reticulum and rumen and sends milk directly from the esophagus into the omasum and abomasum. So they don't need the fermentation bacteria that exist in the um, rumen and reticulum because they're not eating grass yet. So if that milk were to spill into those two stomachs, then that bacteria that's there would ferment the milk causing lactic acid to build up and lactic acid is acidic, so it also makes the animal acidotic. The omasum means many plies or book stomach, so it has kind of folds that may look like a book, I guess. I don't think it looks like a book, but um, you can remember that and then also remember that the reticulum looks like the honeycomb shape. So those are two ways maybe to remember what they look like at least. Um, the omasum connects the reticular rumen to the abomasum and the folds are somewhat like the folds in our stomach where there are papillae and um, those folds basically increase the surface area in that stomach. And this is where absorption of water and salt happen. So the abomasum again is the true stomach, so it's more like our stomachs. It's a simple monogastric stomach, just like ours and dogs and cats. 
Um, it functions closely like ours do um, because it is the only one in the ruminant that is lined with glandular tissue and it releases renin, which is a hormone that causes milk production and coagulation. Um, sorry, it causes milk protein coagulation. Um, prolonged time for pepsin to break down protein, so it's kind of like our gastrin, um, and it's kind of like how the pepsinogen, when it hits our um, stomach acid, it turns into pepsin and uh, pepsin breaks down proteins in our stomachs as well. So it is everything kind of like a monogastric stomach, except um, it doesn't store food. So ours stores food and we can take a long time for it to break down in there and to be digested and then move out. But because animals have a mostly cellulose um, or carbohydrate diet, they have all those other stomachs first that breaks down the food and then sends it to the abomasum um, that basically breaks it down further and sends it right out. So it's not stored there. Um, digestion is happening along all the other stomachs first and then continues into this one. As we talked about earlier, saliva has amylase in it as an enzyme that helps break down um, cellulose or carbohydrates. So um, animals have rumination, which means chewing the cud, uh, where their ingesta moves from the reticular rumen back into the oral cavity where they chew it longer and add additional saliva, which helps break it down further. So they have a four-step process where they regurgit regurgitate the food they re-insalivate the food or add more saliva, um, remastication or re-chewing, and then they re-swallow. So all of those four steps have a re in it because they're basically doing something again. So swallowing it once and then they have to regurgitate it, re-insalivate it, remasticate it, and then re-swallow it again. So because of all of this cellulose or hay breakdown, um, there's a lot of carbon dioxide and methane that is produced. Um, it's a lot of gases in that fermentation process and they have to get rid of it two ways out of both ends. So the first end obviously is the mouth and that's eructation, which is a fancy word for burping. And um, that is something that is necessary so they can release gas and not allow it to build up in that stomach and um, cause a bloating situation, much like that of a dog that has gastric dilation volvulus or GDV. Um, the cow doesn't necessarily have to have the volvulus or the twisting aspect of that. They can still get a dangerous amount of gas built up um, and they also could need to be trocharized um, like dogs need to be to release that gas before it causes major damage to the stomach. Just a little bit on the lipid digestion in ruminants. So there's lipids or fats found in the grass and plants they eat. They are triglycerides, glycolipids, and free fatty acids. And the lipids constitute a small portion of their diet. Um, too many lipids decrease appetite and reduces the motility of the reticular rumen and decreases the fermentation of cellulose. So that shouldn't be a big surprise that there isn't a lot of fats in cow and ruminant diets when you see them eating grass all day long, but they can have um, some fats in there and they need to be able to digest those. So they do that by microorganisms in the reticular rumen that hydrolyze these triglycerides and um, that produces VSAs or volatile fatty acids. And it is used to produce energy or it's stored to um, save for future energy, much like our fat. Um, so they have acetic acid or acetate, propionic acid or propionate, propionate, and butyric acid or butyrate. So those are their three volatile fatty acids.
All right, so getting back to the um, dogs and cats, the small intestine is what we're going to move on to. And uh, the small intestine is basically a tube that carries the chyme. So that is the ingesta that is now moved out of the stomach and um, carries it away from the stomach to finally deposit it in the large intestine. So there are three distinct parts of the small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Uh, like I said before, some people call the first one the duodenum. Um, I think jejunum and ileum don't have very many different pronunciations, but those are the three major parts. The structure of the intestines uh, is basically suspended from the body wall by mesentery. The duodenum receives the chyme through the pyloric sphincter. Um, the jejunum is the longest part of the small intestine where most of the chemical digestion and absorption, absorption occurs. Um, the ileum is prominent with Peyer's patches, which are um, lymphoid tissue, and uh, empties into the large intestine at the cecum in the horse and at the colon of the dog or cat. So the cecum and colon are the two um, major organs that the ileum empties into, um, again, respectively, in the horse has the cecum, um, colon for dog and cat, or at either for the ruminant and the pig. So to be able to digest this food and give us enough time to be able to digest food and really get all the nutrients out of it, the small intestine has made some adaptations to help increase the surface area. And um, these are these microvilli um, or villi and intestinal crypts in the small intestine. So these are what are found in the walls lining the small intestine. And um, the folds in the small intestine, intestine are called plications. Um, this is what you can see on an x-ray and if an animal has a foreign body such as a linear, linear foreign body um, like a string then that string can anchor itself inside the stomach or anchor itself in another portion of the small intestine and basically plicate or really fold up or bunch up those intestines um, which indicates that they need to have surgery but you can see this bunching on x-rays but the uh, folds in general are also called plications. Then there are the villi and the mucosa. So that is that um, inner first lining of the lumen of an intestine, the mucosa. Um, that's where the villi and the microvilli live. Um, the microvilli have a brush border, which uh, we talked about in um, last semester. Uh, that's where all those cells are kept, um, all the endothelial cells that help um, take in the nutrients. And then there are the intestinal crypts, which are um, crypts of lager hands. Um, they're basically the microvilli and villi are the um, projection and the crypts are that downward um, part of the uh, like the bottom or the base of the uh, projection. Within the duodenal mucosa or the lining of the duodenum, there are two important hormones. Um, you'll see you throughout all of this naming of um, digestive enzymes or anything really within the body. Usually if it ends in an IN, it's a hormone. So secretin, this is cholecystokinin. Um, gastrin was one in the stomach. So usually something ending in an IN, it's a hormone. So the two hormones um, that have an important role in the duodenal mucosa are um, cholecystokinin. Um, so that inhibits gastric emptying or basically stops the stomach from emptying further. And that chyme or uh, ingestida that's leaving the stomach is really acidic and that isn't great for the lining of the intestines. So the job of cholecystokinin is to increase the secretion of bicarbonate and pancreatic digestive enzymes. So the bicarbonate is what is going to neutralize that acid. Um, it also stimulates the secretion of enteropeptidase and um, the stimulus for secretion for high amino uh, or fatty acid concentrations 
or low pH of chyme entering the duodenum. So this helps neutralize that low pH or acidic chyme. Um, secretin decreases the hydrochloric acid production in the stomach. Um, once that food is moved out, you technically don't need a really acidic environment anymore. So secretin tells the stomach uh, that it doesn't need to produce uh, hydrochloric acid anymore. And this also increases pancreatic and biliary bicarbonate secretions. So again, neutralizing that really um, acidic chyme from the stomach so that it can be more neutralized as it moves through the intestinal system and um, not going to damage that mucosa with being too acidic. The pancreas is another endocrine gland that has pancreatic isolates. Um, it has endocrine, exocrine function uh, with the groups of acini. So it's a really um, complicated organ. It has many functions, but for the process of um, digestion, they just touch on some of the more important ones uh, related with digestion. The endocrine portion of the pancreatic isolates um, or isolate cells are mostly related to the beta cells that secrete insulin and the alpha cells that produce glucagon. Glucagon further becomes glucose. So um, if you think about the pancreas being what we regulate for diabetes or if those cells are damaged, then they don't secrete insulin then you can think of the endocrine system being related to the production of glucagon or glucose and then also insulin. So endocrine, think diabetes, and those are the two more um, important um, things that the pancreatic isolate cells produce. The exocrine portion is the group of acini, and those are ducts. So anything with an exo on it, exocrine, usually is um, duct related. Um, so the ducts merge to converge into the pancreatic duct and the ex excretions contain the bicarbonate and digestive enzymes that are going into that uh, duodenal area. So the, this is an anticipation of food that causes the increase of these secretions um, from the brain. So the neural and endocrine stimulus from the brain increases those secretions as well. So here are some more difficult words, basically, but the exocrine function of the pancreas also has uh, enzymes that are vital to digestion, and these include lipase, amylase, nuclease, and protease. So usually enzymes um, have ACE on the end of them, and uh, these may seem familiar, especially if you've been involved in cases where um, an animal has severe pancreatitis. So the inflammation of that pancreas is increasing the lipase and amylase um, from that inflammation. So if you think about the schnauzer that comes in um, that has pancreatitis, their lipase and amylase are really increased. And these are the markers on chemistries that we can, um, along with other things, diagnose that that animal has pancreatitis. So those are the enzymes. Then there's proenzyme or zymogen. Um, all the proteolytic enzymes secreted in an active form in the pancreas into the duodenum. Um, as we said before, the proteolytic or protein lytic, um, that's one way to remember that's the protein digestion enzyme. Um, they are all under the heading proteolytic enzymes and they contain trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, proteola, oh my gosh, <laughs> proelastase procarboxypeptidase A and B. So those are difficult for me to say. Good luck. Um, I don't think that they're going to be something that you're going to have to say, so you're lucky. Um, so all of these are related in the digestion of um, proteins, and um, they are what the pancreas is involved in. So there's a lot of enzymes there um, for just digestion in general, and then a lot that are uh, responsible for the protein digestion. So if you're having issues with your pancreas, you can imagine that you're not going to be able to digest your food very well.
functions of the liver um, responsible for digestion. So they secrete substances that are essential. They synthesize nutrients and regulate their release into the bloodstream. They excrete toxic substances uh, and they produce plasma proteins um, like albumin, cholesterol, and blood coagulation factors. So if an animal has liver disease, um, they could have also a coagulopathy or an issue with their blood um, coagulation because of the factors that are produced by the liver. So as you may know, you can live without your gallbladder, but if you don't have one, you should not eat high fatty foods because the gallbladder is what stores bile and bile is what enters the duodenum to help digest fat. So it also contains peptide concentrations. Um, so basically the um, composition of bile is bile salts, phospholipids, cholesterol, and bile pigments, so that's that like, yellow um, substance or bilirubin that you can see if um, an animal has an issue with their gallbladder, they'll, they'll have high bilirubin content and that's what makes them icteric or yellow. There is something called enterohepatic circulation, which is basically the intestinal and liver circulation that are um, coexist together. So the enterohepatic circulation begins with secretion of bile salts into the caniculi. The bile salts draw water out of hepatocytes or liver cells and that becomes liquid bile. The bile is released into the intestine to emulsify fats or break them down. Bile salts reabsorbed by when they reach the ileum um, bile salts enter the hepatic portal vein and return back to the liver and the liver reabsorbs bile salts and recycles them back into the bile. So there's a whole enterohepatic circulation when it's re um, talking about bile salts and how it's released and then reabsorbed back into the hepatic circulation or um, blood circulation by the portal vein. So as I was saying before, um, bilirubin levels in the blood are what make an animal look yellow or jaundiced is the word they use here, but we use icteric more often. They are interchangeable, but you'll see icteric used more in veterinary medicine. Um, so there are various conditions that cause this increased bilirubin level in the blood, and they are prehepatic or um, what happens before the liver and that is bilirubinemia. Um, there are hepatic reasons or actual liver problems um, that cause bilirubinemia or bilirubin in the blood. Anything with anemia is going to be blood. Um, and post-hepatic reasons or reasons outside of the liver um, that cause bilirubinemia. As I mentioned before, the liver is really important in the um, production and glucose maintaining levels in the body. So the first is that glucose is absorbed from food in the small intestine and it enters the hepatic portal vein and goes back to the liver. It's metabolized and then produces energy. And the second is fructose or galactose um, can be converted to glucose by the liver. So um, anything with an ose or toast is usually a sugar. So fructose is um, sugars from fruit and galactose is sugar from milk. And um, those go back and be, they're converted into glucose by the liver. So excess glucose can be stored as glycogen in the liver, in skeletal muscle and in adipose cells or fat cells. So if you eat too much, um, glucose or fructose or whatever, then it gets stored as fat or as glycogen. Um, so glyco glycogenolysis 
or um, the breakdown of glycogen into glucose uh, is what that means. So um, anything with a lysis is a breakdown. Uh, so glycogenolysis is the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. Gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. So neo means new, genesis means to produce or make new. So um, neogenesis is the formation of something, lysis is the breakdown. So though, if you know your um, basic terminology terms, this will be really helpful. Um, ketosis is here as well. And um, ketosis is a process of using fat instead of glucose. Um, and the result is an acidic or um, ketones, I guess, is something that you'll see in the urine of an animal that has diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and that is because they don't have insulin telling them to use the glucose in their body as a form of energy. So instead, the body starts using fat as a form of energy. And the result of the breakdown of fat into energy are ketones. Um, so that is the resulting name is ketosis. The next uh, series of slides, um, you can just look through yourself and um, see the process of carbohydrate and protein and lipid digestion. Um, and then it moves on to the cecum and the large intestine of um, carnivores and ruminants and horses and what the differences are. Um, so in a large intestine, the next couple slides really show the differences in um, why they have different large intestines because of the different types of food they eat. So the biggest function of a large intestine is to absorb water and ions. So this is where these old animals um, are not able to regulate this as much. And sometimes they're really dehydrated uh, or they have really dehydrated feces or hard feces. Um, it's the disruption of this absorption of water in the large intestine um, in a lot of the cases. It also is the completion of carbohydrate or protein microbial digestion and absorption. In the horse, it is the fermentation center or the hind gut. So it is uh, a very large um, portion of their intestine and a very important one. And it is positioned right after the stomach. Um, whereas the rest of the animals have a colon that is uh, on the opposite end of the digestion system from the stomach. Um, so this is where enzymatic digestion occurs for the horse. They are known as hindgut fermenters, um, and so are rabbits. So they have a really high um, hay and cellulose diet, and they ferment this in their hindgut. All right, so finally, the end of this very long digestion process and very long PowerPoint presentation um, but I hope some of it was useful, especially all this pronunciation of these words. Um, but finally, we come to the end of it where chyme passes through the large intestine as feces. So the water is absorbed and it leaves material otherwise known as feces. The sensory receptors are stimulated when feces enter the rectum and basically tell us to initiate um, defecation reflex contractions that move the feces out through inner and outer 
voluntary sphincter muscles. So um, that is when the need to defecate is perceived by the brain. So when it enters food or feces enters the rectum, then it tells us that um, that whole process is finished and we need to defecate.